Welcome to the Higher Ed Jobs Podcast. I'm Andy Hibble, the Chief Operating Officer and one of the co-founders of Higher Ed Jobs. And I'm Kelly Sherwin, the Director of Editorial Strategy. Today we're back with our mailbag episode, and we are happy to have our special friend of the podcast, Matt Trainum. Welcome, Matt. Hi, Kelly. Great to be back. So we're going to start with a question today that has several questions within it, a multi-part question. And it's from a listener that is in the finance, accounting, and budgeting area of higher education. But this is the type of question that could be applicable in in a broader sense. So I'll start reading the questions and we'll, we'll jump in there. So it starts with, is the hiring manager or search committee generally open to training a candidate in, say, certain software packages if that candidate doesn't currently have those specific packages on his or her resume? It's a long question, isn't it, Kelly? You got it. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, I'll keep going here. The next part is, can one negative reaction from just one search committee member sink a candidate's chances? Moving on to the next question, what are the personal qualities that search committees associate with cultural fit in these areas? And lastly, does age discrimination exist in the higher education job search in these areas? That was a mouthful. (laughs) It it was a lot. Was it five parts in there? Yeah, we had a lot there. (laughs) So thanks for the question. And I'll just say that has a gestalt, what we have is a candidate who isn't getting a job and is trying to figure out why, right? Each of those things, this candidate hasn't gotten a job, they're trying to figure out why. And I will say that is such a hard pursuit. So we're at the end of a search process, this candidate hasn't gotten a job and they're reflecting and they're saying, did I lack a skill? Did I anger someone? Was I not what they expected? Or even was it a part of my identity? And those are, those are really hard reflections. And part of a reflection I will give back is that there is not ever going to be a really clear answer to those reflections. So this post-interview, why didn't I get a job reflections are very hard without complete answers and can often be a distraction from more productive reflections. So before we're done with this question, I'd love to take some time and talk about how to shift the questions or reflections into areas that the candidate can act on, because all of these reflections are areas the candidate can't act on. They're about the the institution and something that happened at the institution that they're not going to have full awareness. I love the direction you're going. It makes total sense. So that said, let's talk some about each of these individual elements. And uh, the first one I think was around training of certain software packages is how the candidate mentioned it. And, And you might make that a little bit more generic and say, hey, how much training is it okay to need when I come into a job? And I think there's going to be a lot of the answers to this particular candidate's questions that are going to be, it depends. And so I think it depends on what percentage of the job involves that certain software. How hard is it to learn that software? How much expertise does the candidate need in that software package? When we look at the candidate pool as a whole, what is the school looking for? Is it looking for a technical expert on that package? Even if it's a small percentage of the job, is this the only person that holds it? Or are there five other people in the unit that hold that technology and expertise around that software is less relevant? That really specific question about technology just has a whole lot of, it depends on it. If I'm thinking the wrong way, but maybe I'm reading it into it too much, it's almost like the person's asking if they should even apply and go through the process if they don't actually have that that current experience. And it sounds like, I mean, I know you're saying the answer does depend, but do you have a thought on that? If, if a person's lacking a skill, should they throw their hat in the ring? My answer to that is yes. There is in any job description going to be 30 bullets of what's expected and hoped for. And most candidates won't bring all 30. <laughs> Occasionally that magic moment happens. But they might bring all 30 of the skills, but might not bring the dispositions or other backgrounds that the institution's looking for. So if that's perceived as a less than quarter percent of the role, and this candidate has the other capabilities, then yeah, yeah, totally I would apply. I would probably just chime in here with, I think there's a couple of different areas. For basic software, in today's day, you better feel comfortable with Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google and everything else that's out there. And if you're not quite comfortable with one of them, it's kind of on you to do that sort of stuff. All your basic technology you have to use in an office today. I would say on the more specialized, I think if there's kind of a Coke and Pepsi in in your neck of the woods and in higher education, and you've been 20 years using Coke, and now you're going to move to a Pepsi school, you're going to have a fundamental understanding of the theory behind both programs 
And I think employers are going to be a little bit more tolerant. Not everybody is on the same software. What I would say is if there's a predominant player and they're not using the predominant player, but you are, they're going to have a hard time with a lot of other candidates if you're kind of moving to a school which is using an exotic accounting software package nowadays. So it really does depend, I think, on the situation. But don't think in those instances that you're going to be all alone in that. You're going to need to probably show your knowledge of using the predominant package, but they're going to realize whoever they bring in is probably going to need to get up to speed with kind of this a little bit different of an animal that they have. Andy, the final part of this question asked a little about age discrimination and not to go too far down that path. But if you put this question and that question together, there might be a merging where you're at here, which is, are my skills relevant? And I think it is on the candidate to make sure their skills are still relevant. I was doing a executive search a little bit ago and had a candidate for vice president for student success who didn't know about EAB's work in student success. Well, EAB, you might not have worked with them, but they work with probably a thousand schools. (laughs) They work with hundreds and hundreds of schools. So having an impression that they do the work, understanding that they're a, a tech solution would make sense for someone coming in, even if you might not have worked with them before. And so I think there's a, there's a bit of a way where you show your relevance by showing your awareness of the current place technology is with whatever you are, whether it's finance or student success or operations or athletics or advancement, knowing the technologies that are being used as part of showing that you're keeping up to date. I love that. So let's jump to this, the second one, which is, can one negative reaction from just one search committee member sink a candidate's chances? So you all know that I send out these questions to colleagues around the country and see how they respond to it. And I got the same response from everyone on this question, which is, of course it can. And then a whole lot of, it just depends. And so who is that person with the negative reaction? How strong is the reaction? What is the basis of the reaction? Is it a perception of the candidate or is it based off of something the candidate actually did or said? And so if the candidate, I'm going to do air quotes here, messed something up, was that a clear mess up that others should know better about or was it not? Who is in favor? And so are there other people advocating for the candidate while someone else is advocating against that candidacy? And so there were a lot of it depends. There were a lot of, of course it can. And then I had a, uh, a VP from the West Coast said, really, this is a question of the search committee chair's skill and ability to manage that kind of moment in a search committee meeting. So someone starts saying they don't like a candidate and the search committee chair is able to have that be heard and then still control the power dynamics, any bias that might come up. And this is a good moment to say most search committees are not unanimous. It's pretty common for people to like different candidates. And so one person not liking you is not going to sink your candidacy. One person having a very strong reaction might have some of that complexity. I'll quote a former president who wrote to me and said, in response to this question, and I'll put in quotes here, in highly competitive searches, the smallest things can count. And so certainly having not everybody on the search committee react favorably might be one of those things. I hear that, and I kind of want to temper that thought just a bit. Particularly in today's market, the idea that the search committee is is kind of a papal conclave and is going to anoint somebody the next pope sounds really in that response. And I know the president's been on many parts of a search committee and, and they know that it doesn't always go this way, that we'll choose our number one candidate and we're going to make the offer that we want to make to that number one candidate and they're going to be delighted to come work for us. If you get a job offer, I'd say in today's day and age, I would not presume for a second that you are the first candidate that's there. And if I'm sitting on a search committee, I would not be thinking even my first, second, or possibly even third candidate is an absolute go if I make that offer. There's a lot of different moving parts in that and what candidates are doing. So when you're looking at that that nuance, it's highly competitive as far as positions go. But I also think it's pretty competitive as far as candidates making choices, depending on your institution, the location of your institution, their family situation at the time, where they are, the career. So understanding here that there's a little bit of a give and take, that there's probably going to be on any of those choices, your hire is going to have a question mark or two. Is it somebody not liking them? Is it that they're not up to speed on something? 
But the idea that there's just a top candidate and that's who they get and they execute perfectly on it, I think that's a fiction that people have in their heads. I don't think that's the reality of situations, particularly today. And Andy, as we talk about fictions that we have in our heads as candidates, this goes back to the challenge of even this question, the perception that one person had a negative reaction. I'll tell you, when I'm in a committee, I often ask really hard questions of the candidates I like the most because they're the ones who I think can handle those hard questions. And so, again, we have a candidate who who hasn't gotten a position and is trying to figure out why. And so they're imagining maybe someone really didn't like them. Maybe that person who didn't like that answer, who cringed at some answer, has sunk their candidacy. And again, those are really hard places to go. The component around personal qualities is a similar pursuit where someone's trying to figure out, again, I haven't gotten a job. So if I didn't mess something up in the interview, then is it just about who I am? Is it how I presented and appeared in front of the room? And um, this person, I think, used the question, I think they might have used the word fit in there. And fit is a tricky word. I had one VP reply back and say fit is a difficult word. And so what I would imagine is thinking about congruence of the candidate with the values and campus priorities and maybe culture too. And so if I'm at a campus where everything in the last year on the website has been about social justice, and I'm not prepared to talk about social justice, then I'm not, I'm not lining up with where the campus's priorities are at the moment. So is that a personal quality? Well, I think it's understanding of the campus and what the campus is looking for. And then similarly, you have teams that have different qualities. And so some teams are looking for someone to compliment them. And I love the word compliment because compliment could mean be the same thing. And so I, you know, I have a team that has a lot of this and I want someone who comes in and has a lot of the same thing. Compliment could also be, I have a team that has a lot of this and I need someone who doesn't have this. I actually had three people write back and use introvert, extrovert examples and say, you know, I might have a team of all extroverts. I need an introvert. I might have a team of all introverts and I need an extrovert. Being aware of that and figuring out what that, how that looks and uh, the complimenting of the team. These are fantastic insights. All of these questions together Uh, When we think of all the different components, again, it's about a candidate who hasn't gotten a position and they're in this difficult place of saying, did I lack a skill? Did I upset someone? Was I not what they expected? Is it a part of my identity? And those are difficult reflections because you're not going to always get answers to them. I would love to be able to shift the question and reflection from the candidate into areas that they can act on. And I think we can become better candidates by seeking out people that we really trust to give us really good reflections. And so what does it look like? We might think of the classic example of here's my resume. Can you look it over? I reviewed someone's resume the other day, and this person sent the resume to two people, two of their trusted friends. I will tell you, the other trusted friend sent the resume back and said, looks great. And I sent the resume back with probably an hour's worth of edits, comments, edits, and thoughts. And so what I'm hoping for is that candidates can find someone that they can reflect with about their presentation and how they are present with a team in the strong way that I reflected on that resume. Someone that they can go in front of and say, tell me what I need to know as a candidate that might be hard for you to tell me. A question like that. Be a search consultant for me and advise me on how to improve my candidacy. You know, tell me that good friend who leads a bunch of searches. That kind of reflection with colleagues and friends to help improve our candidacy, I think will help uncover actionable areas more than retrospectively trying to imagine was the person in the corner that was upset, not trying to diminish that, but did that person sink your candidacy? I think that's exactly the place where I want to go with this too. I always think that the end of a job application process when you're not the candidate, I think we like to think of it as American football, but really it's good old European football. In American football, the clock goes down to zero. The game is ended. It's clear it's over with. I think job search, this is European football where the clock goes down to zero. You think it's over, but there's bonus time that's added afterwards. And you really, if you're a fan at the game, you don't really know how long it is that the officials are keeping time on the field and you really don't know. So my first caveat is You need to know that the bonus time is ended before you shift from an active job application to what the next stage is. Because I believe the next stage offers a great springboard. One, for that fostering of that feedback, because it's somebody who has seen you in action and can give you a real feedback. 
but also too, it's just good networking. This is somebody that maybe you connected with that you could keep up with who's a professional in your field and could be a springboard to another open position at that institution or another institution. So if you have the ability and I'd say the the bandwidth to go through that process, because sometimes the hard truths are harder to hear. And if you're at a good spot, it could be really useful to see that as a beginning of a different phase of the relationship. But I think you have to know that the process is over. I think there's a frustration that we're expecting a hard stop and they'll know in two weeks, but you don't know if offers are out for the candidate before you and you're about ready to get a job offer. You have to wait it out till you hear that it's a hard no and no, you're not going to get the position before you kind of flip that switch. You know, it might also be a good idea for this candidate or for other candidates to say, is there someone outside of my network? Perhaps I need to hire a career coach, an interview coach to come and talk with me about how I'm presenting. One of my favorite mentors, a vice president friend of mine, his last position he got happened after he interviewed for a great job and didn't get it. And the search committee was kind enough to tell him he sounded out of step with his answers. And so he went and got a executive coach to help improve his performance and improve his interviews. And he got an interview and a job about six weeks later. And that's a senior level performer who was in his industry and had been in his industry for decades, but wasn't sounding current and was missing some cues. And a little bit of coaching was able to help. And so there might be that option as well for folks. I think about some basic, simple things to pull all this back together. That candidate who feels like they might be out of step are they out of step? Is their email current? I've had committees that looked at emails from Hotmail and thought this candidate doesn't sound like someone who's current because they're using Hotmail. Truthful story. I have had candidates who have had interviews and then afterwards have had search consultants, not me, but had search consultants advise them that, you know, your outfit, your suit is not new. People are picking up that there's a vibe that you're not current. And I, I hate the stress of all that. I hate the added complexity of all that, but I can acknowledge that search committees and people will read into all of those things. And so how well prepared and presented is someone also shows perhaps how current they are. So those are just a few other thoughts in this area. I absolutely love those insights. And I love the fact that you're saying the job seeker, the candidate should look forward on, on actual items that can be changed, not to diminish, like we said, the, the hurt of, of maybe not getting the job and, and looking at what he or she did wrong but instead taking steps to move forward and become current or become better and, and reaching out to the network and being open to that. So thank you so much, Matt, for reaching out to your network to get some insights on this. And we really, really enjoyed this conversation. And please, if you're listening, please email us with your questions for Matt at podcast at higheredjobs.com or tweet us at higheredjobs. So Matt, you want more questions, don't you? Oh, I love more questions. And Kelly, to your point, I would much rather a candidate say that person in that interview that seemed to react negatively, let me think about my answer and let me think, what would I present differently if I got that question again versus think about, I wonder if that question sunk my candidacy. The second version of that, there is no answer to. The first version of that, you can reflect and get a better answer to your question so that the next time it comes up, you're knocking it out of the park. Absolutely. I love that. Hey, I've appreciated being here. Thanks for letting me join. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for listening. 